So this is our lectionary Bible study for Proper 13 in Year C. Let's begin with the Collect of the Day. O Lord, we beseech Thee, let Thy continual pity cleanse and defend Thy Church, and because it cannot continue in safety without Thy succor, preserve it evermore by Thy help and goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with Thee, and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. I always like it when archaisms show up in the in some of the language of the prayers, um, but that's just me. But two <clears throat> more archaic words here are pity and succor. Mm-hmm. And uh, I notice in the contemporary version it says, uh, let your continual mercy instead of pity. And then, uh, of course, help instead of succor. And uh, I would say that those are uh, pretty good equivalents. Um, but pity always intrigues me because... Um, it's something that's uh, fallen more out of use, or at least has been confined more to a slightly different and specific use. Um, kind of a almost, I wouldn't say derogatory, but, but you know, a bad kind of thing. The, the pity is a bad thing. Yeah, that uh, and and you know people say I don't want your pity. You know I don't I don't want. I've, I've always thought pity is kind of underrated, um, and maybe that's a reflection of just how the language has changed. Because to me, I think, well, pity is a good thing, because I have a, more in mind what you see here. Uh, when, you, when you read it in the Bible, mm-hmm. it does, it is a good thing. I mean, you want God to pity you, yeah. I would think. But I think today we think of it as when, when yes. you pity someone. Yeah. You're, you're kind of throwing them away. Yeah, you're almost yeah. disdainful of them. Yeah. I just pity you. But yeah. what was the, the contemporary word for pity? Mercy. I like that. And, and basically, pity is is a, a kind of uh, merciful love. Well, can you say I'm mercy? Yes, sorry, somebody. I'm well, <laughs> that, that's that, that's the other thing is that uh, that you wouldn't use mercy as a verb, whereas this kind of works on both sides of that coin. But definitely, you know, if, you, if somebody says I pity you, it, it con- conveys a different sense than it does in the, from the biblical sense. Uh, so, practically, it, it has kind of fallen out of use because if you try to invoke it that way, you're going to give the wrong impression usually. But I mean, the the pity of God is is, is a beautiful thing. The 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 kind of love that ignores the disdainfulness that you might have fallen into, that uh, ignores the fact that you've uh, you've screwed up and you basically earned all of the. Uh, uh, bad stuff that you've gotten yourself into, but I'm going to love you anyway. I'm going to look past that. I'm going to look at your uh, incredible value and worth to me in spite of all that. Um, no, what, what intrigues me is is how does that kind of mercy or pity cleanse and defend thy church? To me, the first one makes, or, or is a little bit more obvious, when you think about God's mercy cleansing us from sin. Um, And if we acknowledge the love of God, it can help us turn back to God, to kind of go back home, to work on straightening up our lives, that God has overlooked all the uh, bad decisions that we've made to get ourselves in that spot. I'm not sure I really have an answer about defend, though. In, in, any thoughts on cleanse or defend? How does God's pity cleanse and defend His church? Well, of course, if, if you if you consider that that pity has a a, that a part of pity is is loving mm-hmm. God's uh, God's continual loving our lovingness cleanse and defend uh, and, and God's love certainly defends the church. Mm-hmm. We hope. Well, I, that just brought a thought to mind, is that uh, awareness of God's um, graciousness and love may help us avoid the kind of mistakes and lack of wisdom that got us into that spot in the first place, the second go around. Um, so that could be a part of what's being alluded to here, that that cleanse is more for the past and defend is more for the future. 
And then uh, continue in safety without thy sucker. Sucker is one of those words we just don't use anymore. Uh, help is usually how we would put it. And in fact, uh, when we get to the last clause there, we can see how it would relate to cleanse and pity. Preserve it evermore by thy help and goodness. Well, let's look at the first reading from Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> and we kind of jump around a little bit here. Um, the, uh, I was looking at the 2019 prayer book lectionary, and uh, basically its pattern is to take the 79 and uh, make all of the optional shorter readings just full-blown, you know, no option to make it smaller kind of thing. So it will, it will take out, for example, in the uh, uh, Colossians, uh, there's an optional shorter version, but it just makes us read the whole thing. And, and this one, I, th I think it's slightly different. And the Roman Catholic um, original is slightly different, but it, it covers all the same meat of it. So let's look at Ecclesiastes 1, verses 12 through 14. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Where, where did this, who wrote this? Where is this? Which book? Ecclesiastes. Uh, well, we can start with that. We don't know for sure. It, it is technically anonymous, but it is traditionally attributed to Solomon. Uh, and that's because if you look at the beginning, it says, verse 1, the words of the, and here we have a word, Kohelet. And in most commentaries today, they usually just leave it untranslated because it's kind of hard to pin down. It can, it's usually translated preacher. Uh, could mean teacher. It's called Ecclesiastes from the Greek because it means the one who calls together the assembly. Um, so it could be like moderator, host, something along those lines. So the words of the preacher, the, the Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So that makes sense. And also we find uh, a few other attributes that, that would belong to Solomon show up later. Some of his building projects, his reputation for wisdom, uh, things like that. Is this part of the wisdom literature? Yes, this would be part of the wisdom literature, and it's part of the third section of the Bible called the writings. And as we mentioned, this, excuse me, use this? yes, the ones that they don't is Ecclesiasticus, uh, which so sounds very similar, the, the church book. And so in, in more recent times, uh, the term Sirach has been employed for Ecclesiasticus, which is nice because that helps avoid confusion. Okay, so let's look at the passage. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the sons of men to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. And I said to myself, Come now. I will make a test of pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my mind how to cheer my body with wine, my mind still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven during the, first, during the few days of their life. I made great works, I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had spent in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool? Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. <coughs> so I turned about and gave my heart up to this up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun.
because sometimes a man who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by a man who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and strain with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of pain, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his mind does not rest. This also is vanity. So a bit of a downer a lot of times. Um, it's not a very popular book. Um, let me look at some of my notes here. Um, <laughs> the, the word vanity, as you notice, is kind of a, re, uh, a refrain. It, it occurs a lot here at the beginning, but it does occur throughout the book, 37 times altogether. Um, of course, vanity carries its own kind of uh, flavor in, in English. Uh, like Kohelet, it's something that's a little bit hard to kind of convey exactly. Um, so it's not just talking about things that are futile, uh, but also things that are just hard to figure out, hard to understand. Um, and in fact, uh, an alternative translation really could be mystery. Um, I remember, I think in my Hebrew class in Baylor, we were uh, reading part of uh, Ecclesiastes, and I, I remember that's one of the things he pointed out. Uh, some of those Hebrew words are, are like that. It's hard to exactly figure out, and each, each meaning kind of colors the other side, you know. It makes me think back to, um, <clears throat> in Comanche, we had a couple who were celebrating their 67th wedding anniversary. So I remember asking the, the husband, you know, I said, what's your secret? And I'll, I'll never forget, he looked me in the eye and he said, I don't know. <laughs> and the older I get, the more that really resonates, you know. We're not just marriage, but all of life, you know. I, I feel like I used to know it all, <laughs> and the, the older I get, the less I know. It's not just that. It's, it's, it's more this kind of mystery. It's all a mystery, you know. I, I thought I had it figured out, and it turns out I didn't really have it figured out, but I'm really hoping to figure it out, and, and I'm, I'm getting there, but, you know, it's, the farther along I seem to go, in some ways, the farther back I seem to go. Um, so it's all, you know, is, is it all worthless? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I feel like I've made progress. I feel like I've gone back as well. It's, it's all a mystery. Um, well, is, the, uh, is vanity of vanity all is vanity? Is that from the Bible or is that from Shakespeare? Well, that's, uh, well, hmm. Is that out of Ecclesiastes? I can't remember. Well, I was about to say it's all, it's from the Bible, but it, it, it could be a slight reworking. Yeah, no, it's, it's right there in verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Yeah. So it, it is word for word, exactly. Yeah. Wouldn't this be a pretty good description of, of the fall, essentially, of man fell from the will of God? Well, that we think, don't know what the perfect will of God is. We don't. I think Voltaire is the whole, the whole, bi the whole book is, is kind of a meditation on the search for wisdom and meaning in life. And so it, it certainly reflects a fallen condition and a condition of kind of, you know, of trying to find your way around in the darkness. Because we don't know whether it's Adam and Eve or the fall. They knew they walked with God. They knew what the meaning was. They knew all the time. Yeah. They knew him driving all the time and the rocks one uh, important turn of phrase to pay attention to is he mentions under the sun. Uh, and that's like vanity, uh, an expression that keeps coming up. And that is to say um, in a kind of temporal, uh, you know, human perspective. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the corresponding opposite would be above the sun, you know, from God's perspective, from an eternal perspective. Uh, so from our temporal perspective, Things may not quite make sense, um, but God has a different viewpoint. And so part of it is him trying to figure out where's the dividing line and what's the difference and things like that. It, it, it all presses toward this um, kind of almost unexpected conclusion, giving everything that's gone before it. Uh, in chapter 12, the last line is, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Um, which seems to be almost like he's, he's meditated on this question, 
And then he just stops and says, well, just do what God tells you. And in that way, it sounds a lot like Job, because Job is kind of, you know, asking this searching question about the the problem of evil, as they call it. Um, and he doesn't really get an answer. Um, God just says, do what you're told. You know, it's always the, I was in a pursuit of sharing group for years, and one of the guys there was a high flyer, financier, and put deals together, and, mm-hmm. and uh, chased women, and was married, and all kinds of stuff. And he used to say, that vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And about six weeks later, they found out he had stage four. Yeah, oh, yeah I remember you telling me. And Life, yeah. That this is an autobiography of his life. And and he was by far the most accomplished king of Jerusalem, of Israel, because uh, he really reigned over the the time where the nation was most unified, most powerful, uh, you know, a, a player on the world stage, uh, the most wealth, uh, you know, just he was he was the pinnacle, and yet he kind of reflects on it and says, was it really worth it all in the first place? Because um, I'm going to die, and then some bozo is going to inherit all this stuff and uh, mess it up. Damn thing for it. Yeah. And, and when he did, did die, the kingdom split. Yeah, yeah. You think you would meditate more on how to raise up sons who were, would have more wisdom? But that it was a grace that was given to him. Well, something. something. Yeah. Let me uh, read a few more of my notes here. Um, Father Fuller, uh, his instructor at Oxford, I think it was, Sir Edwin Hoskins, he says that Hoskins used to say that Ecclesiastes is the most Christian book in the Old Testament. And he seemed to be the only person who liked it, uh, Hoskins. Um, he, he was the, the sort of the lone fan of Ecclesiastes. And he says what he meant was that Ecclesiastes is a ruthless exposure of what human life is apart from God, and if taken really seriously, prepares the way for the hearing of the gospel of Christ. Ecclesiastes is not so much good news as it is the bad news that has to be heard before the good news becomes audible. Vanity of vanities, all of human life is ultimately futile and meaningless if viewed in itself apart from God, or picking up on the language of the book, if viewed only from under the sun. Uh, Also, one more, um, that word that's translated vanity or possibly mystery uh, is abel, uh, which means mist or vapor. And so you see kind of a a little play on words uh, with that. Um, All is vanity and a striving after the wind. Uh, So it's like a cloud that just kind of blows away. You can't really capture it. Um, There's a lot of mention about this toiling under the sun. And uh, there's probably some kind of reminiscence of the kind of the, the breath that's this vapor that comes out of you as you're working hard. And, you know, is it really all worth all this toil that you're giving it? Okay. Interestingly, it's Abel is Abel, you know, Adam's son. It's, this, mm-hmm. it's the same word that is the name of his son. And, of course, that's the son that's killed. You think, you know, was it even all this time and effort and energy I put into this these two sons, and one goes, kills the other, and... Vanity has, to me, much more of a negative context than <clears throat> mystery. Mystery is, I just don't understand. Vanity is yeah. it's, it's worthless. Well, that's probably well because in modern usage, vanity is, is connected with a 
Well, it's, person, yeah, it's the it's with, with deadly sin of pride. Self love, but but here it's it's uh, futileness, um, yeah. and you know you can read it, mystery of mysteries, it is all a mystery, or vanity of vanities, it is all a vanity, and I think you should read both, sort of, in pairing with each other. So, you know, it's neither one or the other, but both kind of illuminate the other, and give you this kind of sense of uh, the original. In a, in a way. It's in, in Ecclesiastes, kind of the purgative way, where everything is stripped. I suppose you could look at it that way. Yeah. Let's turn to the psalm, which is 49. Uh, the at- attribution says, for the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah. So this was either for the priests alone, or, uh, or uh, perhaps written for a choir of priests? I'm not sure. Uh, So this is a wisdom... I mean, all the psalms are wisdom literature, but this is especially kind of continuing on the same theme. All of the readings here today, uh, or for this Sunday, are really tied together thematically in a way that you don't see quite so often. But this is also kind of this search for wisdom. So let's look at Psalm 49, verses 1 through 11. Oh, hear ye this, all ye people... Ponder it with your ears, all ye that dwell in the world, high and low, rich and poor, one with another. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and my heart shall muse of understanding. I will incline my ear to the parable, and show my dark speech upon the harp. Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil, when wickedness at my heels compasseth me round about? There be some that put their trust in their goods, and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. But no man may deliver his brother, nor give a ransom unto God for him. For it cost him more to redeem their souls, so that he must let that alone forever, that he shall live live alway, and not see the grave. For For he seeth that wise men also die and perish together, as well as the ignorant and foolish, and leave their riches for other. And yet... They think that their houses shall continue forever, and that their dwelling places shall endure from one generation to another, and call the lands after their own names. So you see those last two verses really kind of pick up that sentiment that uh, Kohelet has about, you know, I accumulated all this stuff, and all it does is just pass on to somebody else who didn't work for it like I did. Of course, Solomon didn't really work for it all either. He kind of inherited becoming king. Uh, David was the one who brought all the tribes together. Well, really Saul too, but more so with David. He, they increasingly built things up. Let's see. And then picking right up in the epistle. <laughs> I, I suppose probably the, uh, the climactic, thematic verse in that psalm is verse 3. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and my heart shall muse or meditate on understanding. So, much like Ecclesiastes, it's, it's kind of a search for insight and wisdom. And uh, the, the Bible is big on the wisdom tradition. Um, let's look at Colossians. And uh, when we get to chapter 3, then we're getting into... Uh, the more um, kind of teaching section of uh, of the letter. So uh, first he's giving out some some warnings and some more uh, kind of practical advice, and then he gets into kind of a, a more theological meditation and uh, ethical uh, advice and things like that. Let me see. So verses. 5 through 11 are optional, and 12 through 17 are mandatory in the 79 book. And then in the uh, 2019 book, as we have it on the page here, uh, all of it is mandatory. So we'll look at the entire Are they text here. The hard steps? Well, that's what we've always said yeah. is that they, the, the you know, 79 prayer book is right. optional, all of the hard language of St. Paul. Yeah. <clears throat> sort of skips it over. Yeah. 
they don't. That's 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 negative religion. That's that negative. Be yeah. Positive. So th so that was kind of the, uh, the the guiding principle going in is this let's let's not give people the easy way out and let's not skip over all the hard stuff. The problem is you come up with some very long some long readings. readings. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but you know, in the in the grand scheme of thing, you're talking about an additional two minutes at the most. You know. So Colossians three five through seventeen. Put to death what is earthly in you fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. I think you just have those two verses, and that, that would be a sufficient <laughs> reading for today's audience. If you were black, repent. <laughs> uh, verse 7. In these you once walked when you lived in them, but now put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices and have put on the new nature, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and sing, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And we talked about it before, the short and the long version. You notice where it breaks there, verse 11 to 12. So the shorter version starts with all the good stuff, you know. Put on compassion, kindness, loneliness, meekness, and so on. So it, several times in Paul's letters, we get these kind of uh, corresponding lists of the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit, uh, things like that. So sarks, or flesh, uh, is not just a material sense, but is, is a description of our fallen nature or the fallenness of our nature. And he says in verse 9, you have put off the old nature. Uh, that is, you've been converted, baptized, your sins have been washed away, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, and you've been incorporated into the church, into the mystical body of Christ, you've been joined to Christ in his death and resurrection. So you've, you've died to the old ways, but the problem is you're not necessarily following through with that. Um, so try to live out what has been done metaphysically with you. Put off the old nature with its practices and put on the new nature. Uh, and he gives the impression that this is something that was done once for all, and yet it is also something that has to be done anew every day, multiple times a day, all the time. You have to be constantly setting aside the old and taking on the new. Um, and if you don't want to do that, at least want to want to do to do that, um, the, the 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 theological term is concupiscence, um, basically the tendency to keep doing the wrong thing even though you know better. Sometimes I feel I hear a sigh from God. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Again? And, yeah. Yeah. and he talks about um, sort of several times, but putting on Christ like a garment. He talks about being in Christ. Uh, so that means joined to Christ, um, sharing his life, being a part of his church, uh, sharing in uh, the grace of God and in the uh, indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, he talks about um, some of these things that we uh, that you once did, in, in these you once walked, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, idolatry. You did these things. 
Um, and you have to remember that they are a part of your past, not a part of your future. And you have to be willing to put them away every way. Uh, verse 80 says, but now put them all away um, because they will cling to you unless you actively put them aside uh, and reject them. Um, so just like in the baptismal rite where you have these promises that are in the affirmative, but before you get there you have these rejections. I reject the world, the flesh, the devil, things like that. So we have to have the rejection in order to have the acceptance because otherwise all this stuff just kind of clings on us. It's like static cling. It just you got to peel it off and throw it away. Let's see. You put off the old nature. You put on the new nature, the nature of Christ, being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And he talks multiple times about uh, being more Christ-like, uh, letting Christ uh, be more active in your life, the work of the Holy Spirit being to conform us to the image of the Son of God, uh, he also talks uh, a lot about the, our inner renewal taking place in the mind. Um, and that is, I think it's a, an allusion to turning to divine revelation, seeking out the will of God in Scripture, seeking out wisdom, which is basically um, the, the path of virtue. Uh, things like the cardinal virtues, prudence and uh, justice and fortitude and temperance. And he talks a little bit about... Um, you know, the new life that you've taken on, that you've committed yourselves to, uh, living a life of meekness and lowliness and patience, forbearing with, another, with, with one another. And then there's, of course, a hearkening back to the Lord's Prayer. If you remember in uh, Matthew's version, where he gets to the, the end, uh, forgive us our trespasses, and there's this kind of expansion on that afterward, um, where Jesus reminds us, uh, or teaches us, that uh, don't expect any forgiveness of God, from God, if you're not willing to do the same with other people. Um, so God is perfectly willing and able and ready to forgive you, um, but he's not going to squander that. He's, he's going to give it to people who are willing to turn around and forgive someone else. <coughs> so there's a little bit of, a, of an allusion to that there. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And that's hard to do. You know, that's that's um, a letting go. Uh, basically, that's what forgiveness is, is a foregoing our right to vengeance. Um, so it doesn't mean that everything's all happy and hunky-dory now. It just means that I'm not going to go after you. Uh, I'm going to put that aside. But the more active thing that goes beyond that, above all these put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Um, so it's one thing, one step, to learn to forgive someone, but then it's another step even beyond that to learn to love someone, to treat someone, someone with charity. And then 15 picks up really nicely. And, yeah, so you can see the, the reward of that, of not pursuing vengeance anymore, is that not only will the other person have peace, but that peace will return to you. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That's what you were called to. You were called to peace, and you were called to peace in, in one body. That is, you're to live in harmony with other uh, believers. I love uh, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Which is to say, you know, be so familiar with Scripture that it becomes a part of the way you think intuitively, the way you see the world. Uh, let it be the kind of thing that just automatically comes to mind. Um, so that's almost like it's Christ within you reacting to things. Um, I like to tell people, you know, when they encounter something um, bad and they were repelled by it or disgusted by it or grieved by it or whatever, and like, well, that's Christ within you that's reacting mm. in that manner and, and uh, putting forward that kind of uh, virtuous uh, response. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and we have to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. Um, and that's that's hard to do because you don't want to uh, just kind of come off as lording it over other people and being the one to always tell them the way, way to do things. And But we have to learn to be able to mentor one another and be willing to have one another mentor us. I've always kind of wondered what the distinction between psalms and 
hymns and songs would be. Maybe there's not really a distinction. Maybe it's just kind of a, not a alliteration, but I forget, I forget what the word of that is. Building up a momentum of, of the uh, figure there. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's turn to the gospel. And uh, as in Colossians, we're basically kind of just kind of going one after the other. Now we've skipped, we were at the beginning of chapter 11 last time, and we've kind of skipped a little ways down. So the chapter 11 began with the Lord's Prayer, and then we have some um, interactions with Jesus where he experiences more rejection, uh, rejection by the, the people as a whole, rejection by the leadership, by the Pharisees, by the scribes, um, and so on. Uh, we have, at the beginning of chapter 12, uh, a passage uh, about hypocrisy, uh, at least one parable, parable, maybe multiple parables, and also about covetousness, which brings us to verse 13, where we have this parable about covetousness. Let me read the summary from Father Fuller first before I read the actual passage. He says, The gospel of the day draws together the thoughts of the first two readings and gives them precision. The rich fool is a man who lived his life without reference to God and was caught up in the toils of futility and meaninglessness, vanity of vanities. He organized his life without reference to the transcendent. He did not seek the things that are above. That's a reference to uh, Colossians. So come the crashing judgment, this night your soul or your life is required of you. Because he viewed this present existence as autonomous without any reference to God, because he organized it without reference to the transcendent upon which it depends, note how he thought his own existence was under his own control. It came as a shock to learn that it was God's to give and God's to take away. The rich fool condemns himself to an existence that is, qualitatively speaking, a life in death. And so it also reminds us of Job, you know, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Um, he's able to, with his virtuous perspective, have a proper uh, response to much the same kind of predicament. So Luke 12, 13 through 21. One of the multitude said to Jesus, Teacher, bid my brother divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of all covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is he who lays up for himself, sorry, so is he who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. And you can see very similar to what Jesus <coughs> talked about um, uh, laying up your treasure in heaven, where the moth and the rust doesn't, you know, consume and so on. That you can have treasure, uh, but be aware um, some kinds of treasure are transient and some kinds of treasure are eternal. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the magistrate wanted the, the treasures of the church, wanted to loot the church, and so the deacon gathered all the people and said, here are the church's treasures. Which, in, yeah, which in, in, in one sense is snarky, but in one sense is literally true because his job was to distribute the alms. So, you know, this is where all, the, all of our treasure had gone. It's gone to, to these people right here because these are what we really value, so that's what we spent our money on. The way this parable is introduced is uh, interesting uh, because it's, and if we don't, 
look at it carefully, we kind of gloss over it. It's another one of those cases of Jesus refusing a kind of civil authority. Uh, so, you know, again and again, they want to try to make him king. They're really just anxious to kick out the Romans and have some kind of independent rule. And uh, this is perhaps an, either knowingly or unknowingly another one of those kinds of traps. And again, Jesus uh, cleverly sidesteps those kinds of uh, temptations. So when he, he says, teacher, bid my brother divide the inheritance with me, what he's saying is, is I want you to be a, a judge, uh, an arbiter, uh, to get involved as a legal authority. And, uh, and so when he says, who am I to judge, he, he's not saying I have no authority to do that. What he's saying is, that's not what I'm here for. I'm not here to rule your country. Uh, I'm here to save souls. Uh, so, sorry, I'm not going to get into that. I'm happy to refer you down the road to someone who can take care of that for you, uh, but that's not what I'm here for right now. But he uses that also as, a, as an opportunity to talk about um, the things that he did come for, which are problems like sin, temptation, uh, and things like that. So he says, beware, uh, take heed and beware of all covetousness. So he didn't necessarily come to a conclusion uh, about this situation, but knowing man's hearts and the, the hidden things, and this could be the case in anybody who's going to court uh, after you know, some kind of material dispute, beware of covetousness, um, because that can kind of take control of you without you even realizing it. Because you may be in the right, um, but still that can can be an opportunity for uh, the devil, for evil, for temptation to really come in, sneak in unawares and, and take over you. Uh, so he says, beware of covetousness, for man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Which is to say, you know, if you lose it all, even unfairly, that's not what life is all about. Um, it's a loss, yeah, but it's not like you're losing your life. And then he tells him this story about the rich man who was very blessed and he had an amazing year of crops and uh, he's like, well, what am I going to do with it? I know, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build brand new, bigger ones and then I'll be set for years and years and years and I can... I love how he says, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample... <laughs> who talks that way? But, uh, you know, he, he all of his plans have worked out. Everything is, so far has been arranged and come to fruition just as he intended and planned for and worked hard for, just like Solomon. Um, but yet, you never know when it's all just going to fall apart, right when you think everything is uh, going just according to plan. So, presumably, he is already, um, you know, torn down the barns and built the brand new big ones and filled them all up and everything's happy and hunky-dory and he's looking forward to the reward of all this and he doesn't get any of the reward. That's the very night that he finds out he's going to die. And uh, He didn't really take account of the more important things in life. He got too absorbed in the things. The abundance of possessions is not what life is all about. And, of course, materialism is something that, um, you know, a poor person can, can be materialistic, uh, but with so much wealth around, it's so much easier to become absorbed in material possessions. So uh, this passage from Christ is always very applicable. Um, beware of covetousness, for man's life does not consist in the abundance of things.